Hi all, let's have a look at another very exciting game from the TSEC Super Final. This is in round 18. So could Stockfish win with the white pieces in that razor sharp Sicilian Nidorf variation? So Stockfish with white against Leela in round 18. So we have this Nidorf variation. So a6 and now we have Bishop g5, e6, f4. Bishop e7 and now Queen f3. It's a variation I was very, very attracted to when I saw in over the board chess a strong player user. I thought uh, this is a very, very exciting kind of gambit here with the move f5, so offering the g5 pawn. And I was dying to try it out myself. You might think, well, the e5 square, does that counterbalance things that white's giving up the e5 square? We, we see in this particular book line, knight c5 f6 g takes g takes and this provides some perks this pawn for hooks like on g7 bishop f8 and rook g1 as though you know rook g7 is a key idea it often is we see here so this is the end of the book Leela chooses h5 and now stockfish just plays a3 so extinguishing b4 from the cards as a forcing move for the moment and we see queen b7 here this looks like a peculiar move not entirely in the spirit of things. It puts pressure on e4. I guess one of the ideas is to keep e6 solid. If the bishop ever moves to b7, sometimes bishop h3 is given more, more effectiveness. So for example, if we look at bishop b7, which looks in some ways more natural here, then bishop h3, this isn't as solid when the bishop's not on c8. So this position is an example it seems technically to be really favoring white because rook g7 is going to be strong. And you can see that actually there's also this pin across here on the f7 pawn. So this is quite dangerous for black. This kind of thing, there's knight takes e6, it's very, very dangerous. So there's very, very interesting tactical issues going on. And this is a, a very, very scary line for black indeed. Now things like queen g8 are on the cards. This is a very, very hairy tactical line. You can see how it could end in disaster. So perhaps there's some justification of queen b7 in in view of this kind of stuff where there's a potential pin on f7, there's potential pressure on e6. The bishop is remaining perhaps more solid there. So we see b4 though from Stockfish and now the knight goes back. If the knight goes to a4, it gives white actually after knight takes the c4 square and again there's a lot of pressure on this structure and again with rook g7 we're, we're again igniting this potential pin scenario stuff so where this is a nasty pin on that seventh rank and white's going to get a big advantage there this is just uh yeah just losing for black really so yeah very interesting knight d7 though so not giving that opportunity but here Guess what Stockfish plays in this position if I give you 10 seconds to pause the video. So white play here. Yep, no pin needed. Knight takes e7. There's not even a rook on g7 here. And knight takes e6 is played. So what's the idea of this? F takes f7 check. So this is liberating that f file a bit more. We see king e7. If king d8, then rook g8, and you can see that that bishop being pinned and nothing protecting d6 here could be a tactical concern. For example, like that, that loses a rook. But if, if black does something about the rook, let's try and be sensible. Rook takes d6 is the snag. And now with that knight pin, rook takes f8 is threatened. And things for black are really going downhill, actually, in this position. For example, like this. It's all a bit nasty for black. So anyway, uh, after f7, king e7 is played. That holds on to d6 a little bit. We see rook g8, knight e5, queen f4. And now there is a possibility. Well, there's there's quite a few tactical possibilities. But sometimes, you know, queen g5, queen h4, you know, these are going to be useful. We see knight takes f7 now. It seems this is a very, very forcing situation. Sometimes forcing moves can really transition 
to winning positions. It seems here after Rook takes h8, there's not too many options for black. And now another very interesting tactical move is played in this position, which looks rather devastating. In fact, these, you know, they, they seem like spectator pieces mostly. The queen on b7 doesn't seem that convincing either. And these guys might as well be asleep as well. So guess what white plays here if I give you 10 seconds to pause the video. So white play here. It's a rather brutal situation. White just plays bishop takes b5, rapidly opening up this f file usage that the rook was using an important parking space on f1. So now we have a takes, queen takes d6, and now king f7. If king e8, then check, check, rook takes f8. This is just carnage, as you might imagine. This is just checkmating. So it's better to play king f7. But the problem is the f8 bishop is dropping off. And after this, in fact, there isn't too much of a game here. After this next move, can you see what Stockfish plays here, which kind of, <laughs> I hate to say, it almost like seals the deal. Now, I don't blame Jerome for these openings actually uh, I, I shook out any negativity before this video moaning about how because it's it's basically I think Joan admits this this and the previous game almost like forced wins for white but they balance each other out and they do create the size of exciting games and it is very different how both sides won with white so you do get a contrasting playing style approach it's also, you know, both of these games are evidence that this is indeed a fantastic line to play against the Sicilian line off if you do get the opportunity. So this bish this you know, this stuff really attracted me years back with Queen F3, you know, F five, you know, the idea of sacking the G five pawn. It's a very, very entertaining line, it seems. But this next move does kind of seal the deal. So it doesn't really matter how much neural network training goes in. This particular position here with these sleepy pieces uh, it's, it just doesn't bode very well here. And white just plays, okay, queen e8. This is one of the stronger moves. It's so strong the position that perhaps queen c5, perhaps, is also, you know, because it's targeting two pawns, perhaps this is also uh, nearly winning uh, or winning. Uh, for example, like this. This is a very advantageous position for the table bases to eventually take over soon after. But here, queen e8. And after Queen G7, yeah, we do get um, there wasn't there weren't too many alternatives. If Rook A7, Queen takes H5, Rook G1 check. This is just winning tons of material. That sleepy Bishop, which never moved, is just taken. That's the end of that. So Queen G7 is is one of the better moves. But now an almighty, you know, Rook F8, and. Yeah, this is this is just an extremely uh, dangerous situation. Um, this knight on c3, is it worth mentioning? I guess queen takes h5 doesn't leave too much for black. <laughs> and it ends up winning the queen. Okay, so bishop b7 is played. And it seems white is essentially cashing out to an endgame here just takes on h6 and takes this rook. I guess the table bases are taking over. The the pawns, with this knight on h8, it's not the most inspiring, uh, energetic knight going in the history of chess, that knight on h8. And there's three connected past pawns over here, which by contrast do seem to have a lot of energy to them. So bishop takes e4, we have a4, and it doesn't look good, basically. Uh, these past pawns... They look pretty winning, actually. Uh, black is not really in time to do much. And there's also, just in case, there's this pawn as well, which will really seal the deal. Black's resources have to be split all the time for these connected pass pawns on both sides of the board. So the bishop is used up for the moment, it seems, just to stop h5. It gives up on that idea for the moment. Now b5, so yeah, the pass pawns are being pushed. They're gaining energy and queening potential and now white's forcibly winning a piece and this knight end game is just hopelessly lost for black if king takes clearly you know b7 is queening 
So here, uh, that's just desperate. And the game ended here. I think it makes for two decisive games. In this special TSEC event after, which is currently being played, most of the games are, are just draws. Uh, so if you don't give, uh, you know, sharp position sometimes, these engines are just getting so powerful that the draw rate's going to go significantly up if if they aren't given, you know, entertaining start positions. You could argue, yeah, this is a busted opening. This is one of the more busted openings of, of the 100-game match. So both Leela and Stockfish managed to win with the white pieces. Uh, overall... Uh, in, in retrospect, you know, Stockfish managed to draw some of the games which Leela uh, lost. So, you know, that's a real testimony to the strength and tactical resourcefulness uh, of Stockfish in certain situations compared to Leela, especially. So, uh, okay, if the game continued here, by the way, just for those curious, you know, King D4, uh, the pass pawns are just too much. You know, this is, this is one approach. Just herd the pass pawns uh, like this, and then that's quitting. So okay, I hope you got something from this uh, from this game. It's a, it's a very very exciting variation against the Sicilian Neudorf to try out in our own games of nothing else as well from a research research point of view. Uh, if you want to challenge me for a game, uh, Kingscrusher.tv or Bitly slash Chesspod. If you register, I'll be able to invite you for a game soon after. Uh, there's my suave chat forum at Kingscrusher.tv slash Discord. There's uh, Bitly slash Leader Chess for the Leela playlist or bit.ly slash Stockfish Chess for the Stockfish playlist. Uh, and this is the latest edition for both. Okay. Comments, questions, likes, shares, subscribes with the notification bell. Really appreciated. Thanks very much.